The tiny island of Iwo Jima sits just 10 miles off the coast of Okinawa. We heard the story of a woman who survived a miraculous ordeal and we boarded a boat to go get her story. There's young people laughing, taking photos, wearing hip modern clothing. It's hard to believe that just a half a century ago, people were landing on this island for a very different reason. The Admiral of the Fleet's five stars flying above the Pacific Naval Headquarters at Guam are ready to follow Admiral Nimitz left, about to set out for the conquest of Okinawa. 1,400 ships get underway, and the invasion forces aboard cast worry aside for the moment and beat a tune out on the old squeeze box while Ernie Pyle left watches a fast-stepping jitterbug run up a little hot rug cutting for the biggest invasion fleet ever assembled in the Pacific. That was over 60 years ago. Our invasion is of a gentler nature. The legacy of World War II lives on, and the people who remember it best congregate in this place every day. We found centenarian Kamata Arashiro right away and immediately started asking questions about the war. Our translators had to shout the questions into her ear. I saw her seven months ago. She's in a lot better shape right now. We showed up, she was folding towels, and she animated as we asked her about herself. She didn't want to talk about the war. She said, I'm happy now. <laughs> Iwo Jima was a difficult place to live before the war. People survived largely off of sweet potatoes and fish but they had strong families and communities. All of that came to an end abruptly on April 17, 1945. In 1945, 130 villagers hid in this cave to avoid American shelling. Among them were the centenarian Kamada and her three kids. Japanese had provided bombs for them to commit mass suicide in case Americans caught them. They told the villagers that if Americans do indeed capture them, a horrible death awaits. Kamada didn't want to talk about the war, but her son, Shigihi, was willing. He described American battleships shelling the island from offshore, about American soldiers with machine guns. He also told us about how Japanese soldiers gave villagers a bomb the size of this box that could be used to blow themselves off in case they were captured. Sahiji so took us inside and told us about that fateful day in 1945, about how 130 villagers survived off a of thin miso soup and water, and about how other caves began blowing off their bombs, signaling that mass suicides were taking place across the island. He took us to the back of the cave and pointed to the spot that Sahiji, his mother, and two siblings stayed. And then he told us about when the bomb was detonated. 110 people died this day, but Sahiji and his family miraculously survived. U.S. troops captured and cared for the survivors. They fed them rations, which introduced a whole new diet to these people. Very few prisoners have been taken on Okinawa, but here's one who disbelieved the tales of cruel treatment dished out by his superiors and induced hundreds of his comrades to surrender, having talked with them over a loudspeaker. We're here on a joint American-Japanese project to explore the mysteries of longevity, but just 60 years ago, had we been at this very same place, we might have been pointing guns at each other. It's sad and, uh, and amazing that uh, things could change so, and it sure makes you hope that it never happens again. <laughs>